companies that are trying to adopt immersive technology and aren't quite sure how and coming out of Silicon Valley is trying to figure out how to bridge um, the technologies that are a lot of hype cycles versus the ones that are vaporware and this is going to be a true insider's report on what's real and what's not and where we can go from here. So please welcome Irina Cronin who's joining us from San Francisco. It is? Okay, excellent. Okay, great. Um, yes, my name is Irina Cronin, and I work with Transformation Group as a partner and president, and I also have my own consulting firm, Spout Reality. So actually, there's nothing really too terrible about the headsets that I'm going to talk about, but it's definitely more nuanced. And I have a lot to cover, so I'm going to just jump right in. All right, so um, obviously there's a, a multitude of headsets out there, both for, and I'm covering both AR and VR. Um, uh, there are some that are supposed to come out this year, so I touch upon a couple of those. And um, what I'm going to start out with for each case is, are some of the tech specs, which really make a huge difference as to how those experiences actually appear when people view them. So for the AR headsets, I'm um, going to be looking at ODG, um, basically the R8 and R9 versions, which are very new, um, Meta 2, um, the Microsoft HoloLens and the HoloLens 2, which is not out yet, the Fusix Blade, which um, is not out commercially yet, the Daiquiri Smart Glasses, Epson Mavario BT350, and then this very interesting Toshiba View 6 Dyna Edge DE100 Mobile Mini PC, which is Windows 10, and the AR Viewer, AR100 Viewer glasses. For the VR headsets, um, probably everyone knows almost all of these, but maybe not all of them. Um, so there's the HTC Vive, the Vive Pro, and the Vive Focus, uh, Oculus Rift, and something called Project Santa Cruz, which is basically Oculus Rift 2, and then the Oculus Standalone Go, the Lenovo Explorer, the HP Windows Mixed Reality, Acer Windows Mixed Reality, Dell Visor, and Samsung HMD Odyssey, which are all part of the Microsoft family, and the Lenovo Mirage Solo with Google Daydream OS. Okay, so let's go. So um, for the first AR headset, I'm focusing on ODG. Um, the legacy models that are still uh, being used are the R7 and R7 HL smart glasses, and these are definitely for enterprise. And they've done a really um, good job in terms of getting revenue for these throughout the, throughout the years. Uh, the new set that are coming out are the R8 and R9. The R8 is actually a consumer version um, uh, smart glasses. For the first time, ODG is coming out with this. Um, and it doesn't have a price yet, and it's not commercially available yet. The R9 is for the enterprise, and I'm going to give you a little bit of a close-up. Um, that comes in at about $2,000 for a headset, so that's uh, less than what is uh, the current price for the older versions. Okay, so here you could get a little bit of a close up on what these things look like. Um, the R8 is the one on the left, so it's slimmer, the consumer version, than the one on the right, which is the enterprise version and packs in more power. And here again, here's some more details. So um, the left is the R8, and as I said, it's not available left yet. The R9 is, uh, has been sent out to some developers. Um, but should be available sometime before winter 2018, but ODG very often um, uh, is not too clear on when it's going to come out. It's probably going to come out later. Um, some of the features for the R8, which are really great, I actually did a demo uh, recently at AWE. 
Um, they have clip-on prescription lenses, which I need. Can't see anything without my glasses, except really close up, as I'm doing now. And they work really well. Um, there's also transition lenses, so if you move from different lighting, it, it catches up to what that lighting should be for when you're viewing something. And um, the gaze, the object gaze for selection works really, really well, and it's fast. Um, and here again, you could see what the R9 and the R8 look like from the side views, just to get a sense of the difference of chunkiness. All right, so next up is the Meta 2. So I've tried the Meta and the Meta 2 throughout the last couple of years. Each time I try it, there's a kind of a difference quality uh, update. Um, and let me tell you a little bit about what that's about. Okay, so first let me go, the cost is uh, close to $1,500, which is pretty good. It's been used both for enterprise and consumer. Um, they're developing new applications now, but one of the issues with the Meta is that it hasn't been used widely for either consumer or enterprise. It has a wonderful 90 degree field of view. So if you don't know what a field of view is, I'm, I'm not gonna go into the scientific uh, definition of it, but basically it's uh, the strip that you would see when you, you look through the glasses, how wide it is. So the wider, the better, because then you could see more. So it's got the highest field of view of any uh, commercial, well, not available yet, but commercial uh, smart glasses out there. And the frame rate is 60 frames per second, and the resolution is also quite good. So, okay, so here are a couple of issues. I, uh, each time I tried it, there were issues with tracking with the Meta, Meta 2. So, um, although each time I tried it, the tracking got a little better each time. So before that is uh, ready to actually be ready completely for uh, both enterprise and consumer, that needs to be improved a little bit. Also the grasping. So the way the meta works is that you do uh, with your hands, um, you could grasp objects and move them around and manipulate them and also make them smaller and larger. Because of the tracking issues, this can also be, there's a lag, and many times you try it and it doesn't work. But again, each time I've tried it, it's gotten a little better, so that's great. Um, some of the benefits besides the 90 degree uh, FOV uh, include that the colors are really vibrant. So if you compare, if I've done comparisons with other AR glasses out there, the colors tend to be a little muted, also the 3D effect, the way the 3D looks, the dimensionality of it for Meta is really excellent versus ODG where it looks a little less 3D for uh, the way that they've uh, construed it. And also for Meta, the transparencies of what you're looking at are really great. So um, the objects that you're looking at are so transparent that you could actually see the real world behind them. Uh, which is really wonderful, I think, and you could walk into the object, basically. Uh, for ODG, it's not the same thing. It's a little less, it's actually a lot of it is not transparent, so it's not the same kind of effect. Okay. So, just wanted, if you haven't seen what it looked like in this particular vantage, um, it's only 1.1 pounds. But uh, because of the way that it's built, it tends to sit on your forehead. And it tends to slip down as a result. So no matter how much you tighten uh, the, the strip in the back, it still tends to fall down. So every couple of minutes, you kind of like either have to hold it or adjust it. So this needs to be worked on, definitely. But the actual weight is great. It's not that heavy. Okay, so the other thing is that it's not, uh, it's not unfettered, it's tethered, which means that you need a computer for it to work. Um, I think that in the future, they are going to build a, an unfettered one. I just don't have any information as to when that would be. Uh, in addition to this, I, I believe that they are building a new consumer model, but again, I don't have any more information beyond an NDA that I could tell you more about that. 
Okay, so on to the Microsoft HoloLens. So this is pretty expensive, it's $3,000. And it's only sold apparently since May 2016, 50,000 units. So um, people at Microsoft are like, the reason it's sold that way is because it's experimental in our, 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 the way that we thought about it business-wise. But actually, I think it would have been great if they were able to sell more. <laughs> One of the reasons that it probably hasn't sold that much is that it only has a 35 uh, FOV, which means that it's a very narrow strip that you're looking at when you look through the lens. And if you look to the side, if you look up and down, you're actually losing the object that you want to look at. And that doesn't do very well for playing games or anything where you're trying to move around. And the irony is that um, the demos that they've shown are the ones that you, where you play games. So this is an issue. Um, the other thing is that it's 1.2 pounds. Again, it, that it's in itself is not incredibly heavy, but it has kind of the same issue that the Meta has. It tends to fall down near the nose. So it's very, very hard to concentrate on what you're looking at if it keeps falling down. So these kinds of things should be addressed and probably will be. So they're working on, oh, before I get to the HoloLens too. Uh, just to let you know that um, you can create holograms with the HoloLens 2 with gestures and voice command, which is, is really nifty, actually. I've seen it uh, with developers uh, in action. You could view it with gaze. So that's also as fast as the ODG model that I saw. And also gestures and voice command. And this is fully unfettered. So um, yes, the battery life isn't that great. Yes, sometimes images fall out because the power are issues, but they're working on these types of things. Okay, just to give you an indication of something that could be used besides gestures and voice command, they um, also have this clicker, which most people don't know about and just wanted to show you. All right, so apparently there's going to be a HoloLens 2 for many reasons that I've mentioned. Um, the date for when this might be coming out is January 2019, but that is in no way an official date is tied to possibly CES being the unveiling. And um, the possible FOV for it is 70 degrees, which is a huge improvement, double the 35. But this is basically a leak, so nothing, is, <laughs> nothing has been officially said. But it would be a wonderful product if the FOV was increased like that, and I'm sure that there will be um, kind of ergonomic and weight issues uh, that are fixed with the, the number two for HoloLens. Okay, so next is a Fusix Blade. Um, this was talked about with much fanfare uh, a couple of months ago, so there was a lot of press on it. Basically, it's a headset that is very similar to the Google Glass. So if you know what Google Glass does, you know, you're able to basically look at, and um, uh, you're able to browse, uh, you can, you know, read your email, uh, take pictures, all that kind of stuff. So it does all that very basic stuff. And then it adds a layer of uh, AR light. So basically it's not 3D AR, but it's like overlaid images that you would be able to see um, out, outside of your lens. So it's, it's not like a huge jump. However, it's very light in terms of the headset weight. And the price is $1,800, which is not that bad, but it's still kind of below, uh, above where it should be. It should be lower than that. So um, I don't expect these to sell too much, but it is a, a welcome iteration. And according to the CEO, tens of thousands of units are due to be shipped before the end of the year. All right, so here's the Daiquiri Smart Glass. Daiquiri has been really great with enterprise. And I show you this picture because it's different than what you usually see with Daiquiri with the helmets. 
when they always talk about Daiquiri um, Smart, whatever they have for AR. So here, these are actually glasses. They look kind of fashionable, actually. And um, they're, they're actually pretty good. Um, it, it's not for commercial use. It's still for enterprise use. So it started shipping in November 2017. It's expensive. It's basically $5,000 a pair. Um, so obviously, consumers are not going to buy this. It's a pure enterprise play. The FOV is 44 degrees, and the uh, frame rate is excellent, which makes everything really crisp when you're looking at it, along with the resolution of 1360 by 768. So that's really important for enterprise workers to be able to rely on their eyesight when they're looking through the lens to see what they're, you know, they're supposed to do with the, with the AR images. And it comes with uh, proprietary a suite of productivity apps that was designed by Daiquiri. So um, it's actually a pretty good product. However, as I said, it's expensive. Uh, I do expect these to sell for the major corporations that use um, enterprise uh, productivity tools. Uh, the next one that I'm looking at is the Epson Maverio BT350. And this started shipping in June 2017 with a cost of a little lower than most we've seen, close to 1,400. Um, however, the FOV is only 23 degrees, which is extremely narrow. And the resolution is, is also not that great. So this is a very specialized product. Um, basically, it's the thought is that it should be used uh, with a group, like a museum group, going through to see exhibits that are uh, AR on the wall, basically, and other things like that. Um, so they have like docking stations where you can do several, you could juice up several of these at the same time and have them ready. But beyond that, it's too expensive for what it offers. And um, the quality of the AR image given the tech specs is not going to be very good. It's going to be kind of fuzzy. So I don't expect this to be a very good product in terms of sales. Okay, so here is the Toshiba Fusix Dyna Edge DE100, which is a mini computer, plus the AR100 uh, headset viewer. Okay, so the FOV and the frame rate are both on the low side. So the FOV is only 23 degrees, and uh, the frame rate is 30 frames per second. The resolution is not bad. Um, what makes this, an, and the weight is also really low. It's only 0.1 pounds, so it's really lightweight, which is really cool. What makes this an interesting product is that it's, uh, it's paired with this mini computer, the Toshiba, that you would have to the side. And again, this is for enterprise. Um, and it, that's also pretty lightweight. And with this computer, it obviously enlarges what can be done with the headset. Uh, and is very useful then for, for companies to organize uh, things that they would not have been able to organize. So for example, um, it can record and stream live video, save and retrieve documents, access diagrams, you could get text messages, and you could also do live video calls through Skype. So this is basically a new way for the smart glasses to be able to do these types of things. Um, and this is really new. This has been uh, started shipping in May 2018. So again, even though I think the FOV and the frame rate are not great, this is the next wave of what we will be seeing for the capabilities for these types of headsets. And to just give you an indication of the different kinds of ways you can actually wear this thing, you can have the lensless frame, safety frame, safety helmet mount, and also via head Headband, and th these are the only; these are not the only ones that are going to be available. It's just the first four that they have designs for. All right, now I'm moving on to the VR headsets. Um, does anyone have any questions regarding AR? Just a couple of minutes, maybe. If not, I'll just move on and wait till the end. Okay. So, first up is obviously the HTC Vive.
HTC Vive has a horizontal FOV of 110, which is you know, pretty much the standard now. Anything lower than that is not so great. Um, and the frame rate is 90 uh, frames per second, which is something that you would need so that you don't have nausea when you're actually viewing, viewing experiences, generally speaking. Uh, the resolution is, there's actually more headsets that are coming out where the resolution is better, but it's, this is still very good. And the weight is 1.2 pounds. Um, okay, so the deal with the weight again, even though it's not that heavy, um, there are issues with uh, the headset kind of feeling heavy towards the forehead, which is uncomfortable. And there were, there were issues with the straps. So the strap design wasn't that great. So it would let the headset kind of fall into the front of your face. Um, so uh, to stop that from happening, you'd have to have it strapped really tightly. And you can imagine that that's not comfortable. So um, anyway, I'll get to an improvement about that in a sec. So currently you need two lighthouses and that gives you 15 by 15 um, foot radius, which is the best so far that is commercially available outside of location-based uh, VR. And um, it's pretty sizable, but still there are some improvements that are coming. Um, there are two controllers that you use with this and the price has come down significantly to about $500, which is really great. Um, there is a, a Federless VR upgrade by TP Cast that you could get, and Vive is also coming out with, with theirs that actually, they've learned a lot from TP Cast. It was like a joint venture that they did, so I expect the Vive one to be even better. But um, hopefully in the future we won't even need these wireless um, adapter apps. Um, and the trackers, uh, they, if you guys don't know what the trackers are, you can attach them to your hands and legs and stuff like that. And actually with this, you can make gaming even better, or even some kinds of you know, cinematic experiences could be improved with when you're able to track your limbs. And you can put them on objects too, so if you're throwing a ball, it'll track the ball. Um, those are $99 each. And also a strap, which helps because the audio is not included uh, with this version, is $100. All right, so there's the Vibe Pro. Um, it began uh, shipping to developers in February 2018. Okay, again, like the HTC Vive, uh, it has the same FOV and frame rate. The resolution, there's an improvement for uh, uh, 2,880 by 16, 1,600, excuse me, uh, versus the Vibe 2160 by 1,200. There's a new head strap system that was uh, uh, created for the Pro, which supposedly makes it like almost worth the extra price. So it's very comfortable. You don't have the same issues of it falling into your face. And there, therefore, you could watch longer experiences without you know, having issues like a headache. The weight is down a little from 1.1 to round, supposedly 1.05 pounds. And um, you need to have two lighthouses, just like with HTC Vive. Uh, there are going to be uh, new versions of the lighthouses coming just for the Pro. And for those, you need four. But it gives you a space of 33 by 33 feet radius, which is a great improvement over 15 by 15. So you could see why somebody would actually want to use this product. Um, the cost, however, is still on the expensive side because it is new. It's $7.99, but, and then you also have to purchase the lighthouses and controllers for a bundle of $2.99. Okay, so the word out there is that um, the, the higher resolution, uh, the numbers don't really translate to such an increased ex better experience for some reason. Um, but overall, um, I could say due to the better comfort level uh, that, you, that you have with the Pro, and also there will be improvements I think in the future, and then the increased uh, footage that you have, it's probably worth, worth it to buy if you're a developer. Okay, so the HTC Vive Focus. This is a standalone headset. Um, it's the first six degrees of freedom standalone to be commercially available. If you guys don't know what the degrees of freedom are, basically it's where you can move 
backwards, forwards, side to side. You can jump and you could squat. So basically everything you can do with it. Um, the FOV is 110. Again, the frame rate is a little lower at 75, but that's all they could you know, do for now for the standalone. The resolution is great at uh, 2880 time, uh, by 1440. Okay, so it was specifically launched for the Chinese market because in China, they really don't like the fettered versions. I mean, this is, they did all kinds of market testing and they know that um, that won't sell very well. So this, this was like the first entree for the Chinese market. It's a very high quality product. Um, the controller is currently three degrees of freedom, so it's really pretty worthless. But um, their promise is now that it will become six degrees of freedom, which is really, really great. You could do a lot with that for a standalone for the first time. Um, and the cost, uh, when it reaches the U.S., because we've been told that it's going to be extended from the Chinese market to other regions. Don't have a date to that yet, but when that happens, a current price would be something like 500 to 550 without the tariffs, but I imagine that by the time it hits the U.S., a discount will already be included for that for sale because this they want this to sell. Okay, so I'm moving to the Oculus Rift. Okay, so um, the Rift... Uh, mark, markets itself is having the same FOV as the HTC Vive, but actually that's diagonal. So in reality, it's more like 94, uh, which makes a big difference. Okay. Um, the frame rate is the same of 90 FPS. The resolution is lower than the HTC Vive, and the weight is also lower at a little over a pound. Um, with the Oculus Rift, you need tracking sensors. And these are different than the lighthouses, just technically, I don't have to go into exact, you could read what it says there, but um, it works a little differently. And it's an eight by eight foot radius that's different than the 15 by 15 foot radius for the Vive. So that is significant. So, um, and then you get two touch controllers. The controllers were not available immediately. It took a couple of years actually for that to happen. So the kind of like experiences that were developed for Oculus tended to be more sit down, less interactive, obviously. And it kind of has like that ecosystem that's still built in, even though you have the controllers that are ready because of the limited space that you have to roam around. The cost is now $399, which is spectacular. Um, and you'll see from the other headsets that I talk about, this pretty much blows those away. So. Um, and it has built-in headphones, although people generally replace them. And the sensors are $59 each. So um, basically, overall, this is like second best to the, to the Vive. Um, but I, I think it's going to get better for whatever versions they have coming forward. So that'll be exciting. So talking about that, um, something called the uh, Project Santa Cruz, uh, supposedly the Oculus Rift 2. So this should be PC quality VR that is unfettered and standalone, six degrees of freedom. Um, it already has been released to third party developers and that was just disclosed in May, 2018. Uh, it's still pretty secretive as to what's going on with this. Um, so obviously six degrees of freedom, inside out tracking. Um, there's a, a way that it would work with the, with the headset with cameras. Um, and this should allow for greater immersive content that should match the type of experiences that are made then for the HTC Vive, which would be fantastic given that it's a standalone headset and, and wireless. So um, these are the controllers. They're ba they basically look like the current ones that you have, the touch ones that you have for Oculus, but due to the fact that um, it's standalone and they have to have a connection with the camera. Uh, for the headset, obviously the insides are different. Okay, so you have the Oculus Go. Oculus Go is a uh, three degree of freedom standalone headset. It's uh, $199, $200 basically. Um, the FOV is the same as the Rift of 94 horizontal. And the frame rate is 72, so it's kind of not so great. 
So a lot of people, I mean, it feels really great. It's not heavy. Again, it's like a little over four, uh, one pound, excuse me. Um, so it feels good. It looks good. You put it on, but the experiences that you watch in there could sometimes lag. And it's not so as wonderful as it should be because of the, the frame rate being lower. Um, so if you play something, if you play an experience that should be optimized at 90 FPS and you can only do 74, you can imagine what that does with the experience. So shouldn't do that in this headset. Um, having said that, there are not enough experiences yet that have been created specifically for the Go. So the ecosystem isn't there yet. Um, okay, so this also tends to sit heavy on your face. And uh, one of the one of a big pro big problem is that light gets in under your nose, like in this area, which can really disturb uh, you watching the experience. So that's not good. Um, the controller is uh, three degrees of freedom to match the headset, and um, there's no news. I don't think this will be updated with a six degree because it's a three degree of freedom headset. So okay, the benefits are the cost is low. Uh, it's much better than uh, a Samsung Gear. Uh, you could watch the same experiences in the Gear in this, although there have been some is quality issues. Um, it needs to have a greater ecosystem, but there's probably life in this because of the price. Although, as you can see with the major headsets, the prices have been getting lower and lower and lower, so there's not going to be that benefit here for too long. All right, so next up is the... Microsoft Mixed Reality family of headsets, and there are five different ones um, made by uh, five different manufacturers. Okay, so I'm just going to go through pictures now so you can see what they look like and see how similar they are. Basically, they all share the same controller, but it's been branded by the company that makes the headset. Um, so here I have Leno the Lenovo Explorer. The HP Windows Mixed Reality, and don't worry about that light, all those little dots <laughs> that happens when you're connected, uh, when you're actually working on it and it's connected correctly, so all of them will have those, those lighting dots. Then you have the Acer Windows Mixed Reality. The Dell Visor, looks, which looks really cool, actually, and feels pretty good. And the Samsung HMD Odyssey. Okay, so I decided to put all this all on one page so you could see what the what's going on with each of these. So basically, in terms of pricing, you might think, okay, so this should pretty much be the same price because they're the family, the Windows family of headsets. But uh, as a matter of fact, they aren't. There's some price differential. Um, for the Lenovo Explorer and Acer, those are both $399. HP Dell is $449. And HP and Dell is $449. And Samsung comes in at $499 as the most expensive. Um, the FOV, all of them are 105 degrees except, except Samsung, which is 110. And this is supposedly horizontal. Um, the resolution is quite good, actually, and it's, it's higher than, than most. And the Odyssey comes in a little higher at uh, 2880 by 1660. And all of them were launched in October of last year, except for Asus, uh, which had a kind of a different design. And I think it had more to do with the design rather than the tech that it came out in February 2018. Okay, so um, it's all six degrees of freedom, inside out tracking, however, this is, these are fettered headsets. This is not standalone, which is a huge deal. Um, the reason why they did the six degrees of freedom inside out tracking is because they didn't want to have the lighthouses or sensors that you would have to put up. Um, however, the fact that it's all fettered and these uh, are associated with this, these prices, if you compare that to the Vive and, and the Rift, you can see that it's in like direct competition all of a sudden because those prices have come down. Um, and I'll give you an indication of some of the issues. Um, the weight of the Acer headset is 1.87 pounds. That's heavy. <laughs> and it doesn't feel good. Um, the HP headset is 1.84 pounds. 
and Samsung is 1.42. So these are much heavier than what you would get with uh, the Oculus and the Rift. The Rift is 1.1 and you, you have issues with that. The Dell Visor is at 1.3 and only the Lenovo Explorer is at 0.84 pounds. Okay, um, so I don't, I mean, the prices for these have been coming down as well. I don't know how low they can go to be able to have these sell, but there are obvious issues with this with weight and also with competition and some quality as well. So um, not too sure where these lines are gonna go. Maybe there'll be like versions two for these things and they'll be better. Okay, so next is the Lenovo Mirage Solo with Google Daydream operating system. And this is uh, 94 degrees horizontal FOV. The frame rate is 75. So again, you, if you have a 90 frame rate uh, experience, you don't wanna play it in this headset, um, which is an issue. The resolution is okay. The weight, 1.42 pounds, it's heavy. Um, this has six degrees of freedom inside out tracking, but the controller is three degrees of freedom. So it's basically not useful at all. I mean, you could go backwards and forwards and things like that <laughs> in the experience. And a lot of people complain and they said, well, can you make a six degree of freedom? And the issue is that for Daydream, um, experiences that were made for Daydream were typically made with three degrees of freedom because uh, Daydream was for cell phone, you, you use a smartphone with it. Um, and this is an issue with this, so it's not gonna get updated to six degrees of freedom. So that's one big issue. The other issue is that the current amount of experiences that are available for the Daydream ecosystem is relatively low. So uh, given that, even though this headset does not, you know, performs quite well for what it is, I don't see that much of a future for it going forward, so again, this might be updated to a version two. All right, and that's all I have. So, uh, it's a lot of information, and if anyone has any questions that I haven't covered, I know a lot about these things. Yes? Uh, curious about uh, base stations. I think uh, becoming unfettered is critical. Uh, so let's say I had four people in my house in a large area. Um, what are the prospects of having maybe one powerful computer with four uh, video cards driving each one, or does each one with these current configurations require a separate computer? What are your thoughts on that? That's a great question. Okay, so you're saying um, you want to basically have it run four different experiences at the same time, right? Yeah, so for example, I. Uh, you know, if you spend, say, $1,500 for the HTC Vive Pro, like, yeah. and, and if you have one, you know, computer for four grand, it's better, it's a lot easier than having four computers for four grand, it cuts your cost of investment considerably. Yeah. Uh, so I'm just wondering what your thoughts are on that. It would probably not be a good idea to load all four at the same time. Um, there are issues with one experience sometimes lagging, and then you have a problem with the uh, tracking when it comes to the lighthouses if you're doing Vive. So um, if you're doing four different experiences, basically you need to have four different areas that have four different sets of lighthouses and those are farther away from each other, not all in the same place. So you would have to have four different computers. Yeah, you're welcome. Yes. I, um, uh, as far as uh, the augmented reality glasses, uh, it's the see-through, um, optical see-through. Have you seen any indication that any products have um, like a subtractive screen or subtractive layer as opposed to just additive graphics so that you can actually create some opacity in the graphics? Okay, so um, this is also a really cool question. Um, and it is on the wish list of a lot of people who do AR and want AR to happen in the future. Uh, currently, there is no one out there that will claim that they have figured this out, although I know they're working on something like this. It's extremely difficult to include a subtractive element uh, in AR for reasons that you can understand because not that object has to be tracked 
and then there are all kinds of other things that need to be done for it then to be subtracted. And if you have an object that is there close to it or you know, on top of it or something, that also, now you have two objects that need to be taken care of at the same time. So mathematically speaking, the tech for that is enormous. But they are working on doing something for that, definitely. I cannot tell you. I'm sorry. <laughs> you know, but you can't tell me? Exactly. No, 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 no. It, it's, uh, let's just say that uh, I can tell you that almost all the major headset manufacturers are dabbling in trying to figure this out. It's just that um, if you include this type of feature, it's going to add to the weight of the headset because of the tech that's involved. And that is an issue that they need to figure out what to do. Or you would have to have a, a fanny pack, basically, with the computer to be able to deal with that kind of thing. And Magic Leap thinks that's OK, but other uh, and as you can see, I didn't even touch Magic Leap because it's very speculative in terms of what it is. But yeah, so Magic Leap has basically a little computer thing that you attach. But most of the headsets, they want the really lightweight looking glasses without the attachment. Yes. Okay, yes. Um, so many heads, leading up the industrial headsets, yeah. are just looking consumer ones. Maybe a dozen headsets all needing special boards incompatible software. The VR, VR market is still small. The developers are just brutalized um, having to do all these parts. They end up picking one or the other, or maybe two headsets and reducing the market. Is there any, do you see any move whatsoever on, gee, we all work on a PC, let's all come up with a common API that you can just work Okay, so there are two ways of answering that. The first one is that by the time Apple comes out with their headset in 2020, the other ones aren't, a lot of them are not going to survive because they, they will, will have run out of cash, or that Apple buys up a number of those. Okay, so Apple will be able to be the winner then there. Um, the other way to answer that is that there are apps that are being built out there that will be able to, and again, it's a great legal issue, um, be able to uh, translate the different types of experiences made for particular headsets into another headset. And it's very hard because you're dealing with huge companies that want to hold on to their IP and they don't want those experiences to be able to be translated, but people are working on those types of apps nonetheless. Yeah. Well, yes. I, mean, uh, I guess what I was seeing, uh, really most titles that are available for uh, you know, to see are also available for uh, and, a lot, and actually a lot of times the women in Israel does have short choice. Yeah, okay. So for... Uh, the developers have had to work on separate experiences for both the HTC Vive and for Oculus. So it has to be formatted for, for both of them separately. Um, but then for the, the Windows, um, since it has a lower FPS, the, a lot of those experiences do not play well on the Windows-related headsets. Yeah, so it's still very fragmented. Well, the Windows is lower. Right? Yeah. <sighs> Yes. Well, so I was, uh, well, I have two, two questions. So one, uh, one was more opportunity, I guess, but it seemed like, so like the HTC focus seems to be more of a marketing that's actually yeah. not tethered and since you're agree. Yes. Yes, people are pretty wild about the focus. So they were bummed out that it was only available in China, and they they obviously pressured HTC, and of course it's going to be made available in other places. China was basically their um, tryout space, which they knew pretty well before even going into it because they tend to be pretty conservative, um, that it was going to do really well there. So I can only see even greater improvements with that, and it, it's very exciting. Um, I, I, don't, I don't. I wish. I hope uh, there's no official uh, statement as to when it will be available. Yeah, yeah. the other thing I would think that you see would be will it be clear that it's going to survive? Yes. Um, 
Absolutely. HTC and Oculus, in my point of view, will survive. Um, they're going to go head to head in terms of the technical capabilities. Oculus started at a little lower, as I said, you know, having to do with the types of experiences that were made for it due to the tech that they made. Um, but I think they're both going to be pretty much head to head in tech very soon. And I guess this is you can't talk about, but uh, people are starting to talk about 12 year rendering. It's like, I wonder if you can see that. Uh, are you saying? Um, in, oh yeah, absolutely. Uh, th it's it's pretty much a done deal that the new headsets will be able to to track your eyes fairly well. And there's all kinds of apps that you could add to do that, but that it will be built into it because so many different verticals want that. You know, uh, businesses absolutely want that. Yes. When you wear glasses and you get old and you get multiple lenses, so far the VR headsets were great because you look straight ahead all the time. It's the distance focus that all works. But you look down in the headset and it's gone. So the trouble will be when they expect you to eye track. Uh, again, you better be 25. And again, I can do that maybe eye tracking is bump once. The, the, the eye tracking itself seems to work fairly well, but the as you move out of that central area of glasses, go down the focus breaks and it, it does break it. it. It breaks your experience. So you have to move your, your head down. And sometimes the software that we're writing the experience doesn't work that way. They want you to look down mm -hmm. and you can't. Um, I expect that that will be compensated for in the new headsets, having to do with improved technical spec specifications. I mean, obviously, um, they're always trying to save on power by making your focal point where you're supposed to look and the other areas then are, are not, uh, the, the resolution isn't as high and other types of tricks that they have. But as resolution in general goes up uh, and other types of, uh, even frame speed goes up, those types of issues will be neg negligible, I think, except for those that are like absolutely amazing with how they view things. And you'll always have those. Something that I guess uh, use both the uh, all ones and the one that I have. I guess it's usually there, but I tend to use not use my glass. Yeah, 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 yeah. There are issues with uh, wearing glasses for the hollow. Yeah, each each of them has their own issue, um, and hopefully maybe in the future it could be more uh, personalized because there are issues of everybody does not have the same kinds of width between eyes and stuff like that. Yes? Um, I'm curious about the integration of potentially uh, AR on VR, so for gesture technology. So let's say I'm in this virtual world and you know there's such great gesture technology available now. Yeah. Uh, and I just want to bring up a uh, heads up display and touch it. Same way you would with Microsoft uh, HoloLens. So, how do you see that happening? Is, is, or is that something that's in it? Okay, so the idea is that Apple is going to come out with a combined uh, AR VR headset, or at least that's what people are hoping. They're hoping so much that they're saying it's going to happen. Um, and this would be the, the real sense of the word of mixed reality versus what Microsoft is calling mixed reality. And I just want to jump in here for a second and let you know why Microsoft actually is calling the headsets they have mixed reality because they're just VR. And the answer now is that they expect this type of technology to be able to go between AR and VR to be the norm. So they're just starting to use that term now. Okay, so yes, the expectation is, is that this will become a standard way of doing things. You could effort, effortlessly go between AR and VR. So yes, the hope is, yes, yes, the hope is that the controllers can go away and you could use your hands to be able to do that. So, and, and the tracking will be more sophisticated that it would be able to pick up your hands versus the actual points that they have on uh, the controllers. Yeah, that's where it's moving to. Uh, actually, yeah. Yeah. It sounds like the Vive Focus 
was uh, there. So can you talk a little bit about how, how they're supporting you? Okay, so no, the focus is not um, AR. Uh, possibly in the future, I, that would be wonderful. It's, it's definitely VR, yeah. Yeah, I mean, anything that's standalone, everyone wishes and wants that to be AR as well. Because uh, a lot of the benefit that you get from having AR is location-based AR. So you're walking down the street and things appear before you. And you can't have that when it's tethered, tethered to a computer. Yes. Any other questions? Okay, great. Thanks so much for having me.